Thank you once again, all the vendors that came today. Greatly appreciate it. My first speaker is Jim Barsha. Jim was born in Bay City, a lifelong resident of Bay County. He attended Bay City Central, graduated from the FCSU in 1974 with a degree in public administration. He served three terms as state representative as a Excuse me, five terms at Michigan Senate, five terms at U.S. Congress for the Flight and Fifth Congre Congress District, and on November 16th was elected the Bay County Executive. With that saying, I want to introduce you to your County Executive, Jim Barsha. Thank you, bro. Thank you very much, Matt. I want to uh, thank you, Matt Beaver, for the exemplary and stellar job you're doing as our Director of Administrative Services for Bay County overseeing our outstanding department, Bay County Department of Veterans Affairs, and hopefully uh, most everyone in the room knows or has worked with Mark uh, Kazmarek and Gary Bowersock. They really work hard day in and day out to serve our veterans uh, and residents of Bay County that have served in the military or, or have uh, members of their family who have. So, I just want to uh, thank everyone who worked on this, especially Matt and the people who helped put this all together, and especially uh, warm gratitude to all of the vendors who are here today. Thank you. We really appreciate you, and you make this the success that it is. So I want to just take a moment. We have some great speakers to follow. I want to welcome them and, of course, for, and thank them for the great jobs that they do in their respective roles in the State House and State Senate and also in uh, Congress, uh, in the U.S. Senate and, of course, in the U.S. House down in Washington, supporting our veterans. And we're blessed in Michigan here to have outstanding members representing us down in, in Washington. I want to just take a moment to reflect on the gratitude that we all share for those who have served our country uh, on each and every Veterans Day, the people who have risked their lives and separated themselves from their loved ones um, and possibly come back from their military service, either with physical impairments, um, but hopefully alive, but also uh, those that might have trauma, experienced mental trauma as a result of their service to their country. And so we can never express our gratitude and our appreciation to the great men and women who served in the military defending democracy and our American way of life around the world and down through the history of our country, beginning, beginning with the American Revolution and the Civil War and all of the engagements uh, after those terrible conflicts. So when we see a vet, always remember to thank them for their service and protecting the freedom that so many of us here in our country take for granted each and every day. That's why everywhere around the world we're kind of the country where most people would like to be because we're a land of opportunity and we embrace liberty and freedom and democracy and self-governance. So I won't uh, speak at length here about our appreciation for veterans even though we should as we um, honor our veterans tomorrow on Veterans Day 2023. But I do want to thank everyone who's here. I want to thank Matt and everyone who, all the vendors and Gary and uh, Mark. Mark's been with us since I became the county executive and works so hard day in and day out serving our veterans and helping them access the benefits that they've earned and that they're entitled to due to their service. And of course, we, we were very fortunate to uh, be able to recruit Gary Bowersock, who served 23 years at the Veterans Administration Hospital and Facility or Center over in Saginaw, and brought a wealth of experience of the federal, entitled, uh, the federal benefits that our veterans are entitled to and helping our veterans navigate uh, what some kinds, sometimes can be a challenging uh, amount of bureaucracy and process to work through uh, to secure those benefits that they've earned. So 
We are blessed to have that department. I hope if any of you have had an opportunity to get down on the, uh, to visit the county building and talk to Mark or Gary on the first floor, it's a beautiful office. It's one of the things that we wanted to do when I came into office back in 2017 was upgrade the status of our veterans' offices in Bay County. More visible, more room, and, and enhance the office a little bit. So with those remarks, I, I wanted to be brief and thank everyone and uh, thank our speakers who will be following me as well as, again, uh, all of you who worked on this event today, but most importantly, not only tomorrow, but each and every day, think about our veterans who have served their country and protected us uh, and, and also pro protected democracy around the world. So. Uh, we'll be thinking of them tomorrow and each and every day throughout the years ahead. And I guess, Matt, with that, I will, I will depart the podium. And again, thank everyone for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you again, Jim. We're very, very lucky to have all of our knowledge and being our county executive. Thank you for all. He backed our Project Greenlight. If you guys want to know what Project Greenlight is, it's through November 6th through the 12th. That's what we do. So um, if you watch the county building, we light it up in green. The city did a great job uh, lighting up the, the city hall. So we definitely support if you have green lights, turn them on to the November 12th, please. And with that, our next speaker is Quentin Gross. He's with uh, Peter, the Senator Peter's office. So if you don't mind coming up, uh, Quentin. You scared me. I was like, I'm looking at the list. I was like, last. Cool. I'm gonna go by rank. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. I know we're all having a great day today. Um, sorry, I was not ready. I totally looked at the schedule and I'm like, I'm not until 105. I have a couple of minutes here, so I did not have everything pulled up. So give me one second. Apologize. There we go. Yeah, um, so good afternoon. My name is Quentin Gross. I'm the Regional Director for U.S. Senator Gary Peters. It's my pleasure to be here with you today to celebrate this Veterans Day. There we go. Um, the Senator wishes that he could be here with you all, but unfortunately he is uh, in D.C. Doing, doing the work that we uh, uh, elected him to do. So um, you don't become the, the most effective, name the most effective senator uh, of the group for two terms in a row without doing a lot of work. So he is there right now, currently. Um, as a quick recap, the Senator um, serves on a number of different committees within the Senate. Just wanted to share those with you. Um, currently, he is the Chairman of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. Um, in addition, he also is recently added, uh, was recently joined the Appropriations Committee, where he sits on the Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, um, and the related agencies, commerce, justice, science, um, homeland security, interior, military construction, veterans affairs, and other related agencies. And then the last two committees he's on is the Senate Armed Services Committee, as well as the uh, um, Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee. I only bring that up because I just want you to know kind of what the work, the kind of the work that he's getting into. Um, but if there's ever an issue that you're having with a federal agency, we encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, both myself and Lacey uh, represent the Bay Region Office, where we oversee nine different counties throughout the state, Bay included. Um, so we're always here to help. Um, when it comes to um, veterans, um, or rather our veterans, um, we know that the, no one, excuse me, um, the members of our military don't ask to fight any war, but we know that they do answer that call um, of duty and courage and, uh, with courage and honor, and for that we can never truly really repay them. Um, it's because of this unparalleled patriotism that the Senator remains committed to ensuring that all of our veterans have, and service members have access to benefits, health care, and the quality services that they've earned. Um, it's, in addition, it's also personal to the Senator. Um, he himself uh, volunteered to serve in the U.S. Navy Reserves, um, where he rose to the rank of Lieutenant Commander and then volunteered again um, for service around the 9-11 attacks. Um, he's also earned a diploma from the College of Naval uh, Command and Staff in the U.S. War, uh, US Naval War College. Um, 
if you look back in history, it's not, it's not only personal for him, for his own personal service, but his family as well. He had uh, his, his forefathers fought alongside uh, George Washington, the American Revolutionary War. He, uh, they also fought in the Union Army in the Civil War, and his father himself was a World War II veteran. So again, making sure that our veterans have the things that they need um, is, is personal for the senator, and he always wants to make sure that they have exactly what they need. Um, a couple of things that the senator's been working on in the realm of making sure that our veterans do have those things that they need. Um, one of the issues that we hear about in the office is that if I get remarried, if I uh, if I lose my sp if my spouse is lost uh, um, in a conflict and they pass away, um, the surviving spouse, if they're under the age of 55, they may lose their benefits if they remarry. Um, the senator recently uh, just co-sponsored the Love Lives On Act, um, which would ultimately um, provide the ability for the Department of Defense and the VA to ensure that no matter if they, if they do remarry at any age, they have the ability to retain those benefits because those are things that they've earned. Um, you, know, you lose a loved one who goes to fight for this country, we should be protecting that family as well. Um, and then last, the other item, uh, he also signed on to a resolution, which was the National Veterans Small Business Week resolution. Um, so October 30th through November 4th, uh, it was the National Veterans Small Business Week. Um, and it, it basically highlighted 1.7 million veteran uh, small-owned businesses um, that employ over 2.9 million individuals. So giving recognition to those veteran business owners that come back and start a small business. Um, in closing, the senator remains focused on everything from PFAS and clean drinking water. Uh, workforce development is another area where he is very focused on and ensuring that um, as we're looking at those future careers and the chips manufacturing, do we have the people to, that have those skills in order to make sure that we can uh, be a successful nation. He believes that you can't be a great country if you don't make things, and so we have to make sure that the workforce has those skills in order to do it. Um, appropriations is a hot topic right now, obviously, with the, the budget. We are looking at the um, November 17th uh, shutdown if the, if the government isn't able to find those bills, uh, or rather pass those budget bills. Um, we know that another CR may be on the horizon, but thankfully with a Speaker of the House back in, um, the Congress is chugging right along with that. Um, you know what, at that point, I'll, I'll leave it there. You know, um, you all put everything on the line in order to, to defend our freedoms, our families, and our values as Americans. Um, and, the, and Senator Peters will never stop fighting um, to support you and your families and uh, is incredibly grateful for your service. So thank you for having me here today and um, happy Veterans Day. Right now or after? Anybody have any questions for Mr. Peters' office? Okay, after, okay. Uh, Mr. Kild Kildee got caught up in an event today, but gives his best, uh, so we're gonna skip um, Congressman Kelly's office at the moment. And with that, Kristen Rivet McDonald, uh, aides, Mr. James is here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a little shorter than the last speaker. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm the Director of District and Constituent Services for State Senator Kristen McDonald Rivet. Uh, we represent the 35th uh, State Senate District here in Michigan. Uh, so, to give you an idea of what that looks like, uh, we represent portions of Saginaw, Bay, and Midland counties. So, the way I like to think of it is uh, we've got the city of Saginaw, the city of Bay City, the city of Midland, the townships around them, and the townships in between that connect them. Uh, and if you want to see what that looks like, come talk to me because I've got a business card with a map on the back that shows that. Um, anyways, I uh, do just want to say uh, happy Veterans Day and thank you to uh, all of our service people in the room uh, for defending our state and our country. Um, we only have what we have today because of you and uh, we're really grateful to be a part of, of this event. I just want to say thank you to uh, Mark and Gary and Matt uh, and, and Bay County and all the partners that we have here in the room uh, for making this happen. Uh, events like this, uh, collaborations, are what makes Bay County special. And uh, 
the Bay County VSO is tremendously helpful um, in working with our office on a number of issues. I out of all the times I've called them, I still don't think there's been a time where I called, said we had a veteran constituent that needed something, and they didn't help. So I uh, just want to say thank you for, for all of those things. Um, okay, so a few things I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about a, a few uh, legislative accomplishments that we've uh, achieved thus far that are um, broadly applicable that are going to help our vets and uh, you know just civilians as well. Um, so we've only been in office since January, um, but in that, well, it's getting to be some time now, uh, but still feels like a breeze. So in that short time, uh, we did get a um, billion dollars in tax relief uh, passed and signed into law that is going to kick into effect for this 2023 tax year. Uh, what that looks like is a repeal of the uh, 2012 uh, retirement tax. So uh, those public pensions, those private pensions, 401k, um, you know, distributions, all of those sorts of things uh, are going to see that uh, tax removed. Uh, so you know, it, it's something that had to be done, right? Uh, we all know that our seniors that are living on fixed incomes uh, in this economy today uh, really don't have a lot to work with. So getting rid of bad policy like that retirement tax was a top priority um, of the legislature coming in this year. Um, and another piece of that tax relief um, is the boosting of the Working Families Tax Credit, which is legislation that Senator McDonald Rivet um, did a lot of work on before she took office in her um, you know, previous roles and um, you know, was able to see through to the finish line. So uh, now, the state's match of the federal earned income tax credit is going to jump from 6% to a 30% match of the federal credit. So when you take the state and the federal credit together, that's an average uh, refund of $3,100 uh, for uh, the average person who qualifies for that tax credit. So for uh, a working class family, right, somebody who's in that, uh, you know, six to 10 jobs in our region pay less than $47,000 a year. Someone in that, that pay range, $3,000 is, is game changing, right? That pays for a lot of necessities and we have data that shows that uh, when you give folks that money back in their pockets, they use it for uh, gas, groceries, utilities, insurance, all of the things that we have to pay for, right? Um, so we were really excited about that. Um, we've also got some legislation moving around um, prescription drug affordability. So um, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but the governor had a um, task force that found that nearly a third of people between the ages of 19 and 64 on life-saving prescriptions stopped taking those prescriptions recently because they were just priced out of reach. Uh, so the legislation that uh, you know, our office sponsored and is leading on right now would establish a five member uh, independent commission, if you will, uh, of members with no ties to the pharmaceutical company uh, from across sectors. We're talking uh, the pharmaceutical, or not the pharmaceutical industry, excuse me, healthcare industry, um, economics, uh, education, et cetera. And this board would be tasked with uh, monitoring and researching the price of uh, critical prescription drugs and have the ability to set uh, upper payment limits so that these prescriptions are not priced out of reach uh, for our seniors. So that legislation is, uh, we started that this fall uh, in September. We've already cleared it out of the Senate. Um, it's over in the House now. Uh, we're probably not going to see any movement on that before the end of the year, but uh, that's what the new year is for. We're looking forward to uh, continuing to move that legislation forward. Um, so, and then a last thing I wanted to touch on a little bit here was um, some exciting things that came out of the veterans budget for this year at the state. So uh, there's a veteran suicide prevention program uh, offered by the State Department uh, that got $1.2 million in funding. Uh, we know that uh, right now, even for civilians, right, uh, there's a lot of uh, mental health challenges that people are facing. And when you're somebody who's served in our armed forces, it's a hundred times more difficult, right? So, uh, you know, we're really happy to see that additional funding that's going to go towards, uh, you know, funding more full-time employees to work with 
uh, these people come to fruition in this budget. Um, there's also some veteran homelessness grants that um, I think we'll probably talk about a little bit more uh, once we get into the Q&A. Um, but those are uh, a new thing for this budget and uh, we're really excited to see how that pans out. Um, the MVAA also got some uh, additional funding for uh, some more staff to help with the processing of claims that are coming in um, in regards to the PACT Act, which I think uh, we'll also talk about some more in the Q&A. Um, and then of course, uh, there was $4.25 million allocated for veteran services grants because again, our veteran services offices are our go-to agency um, when we have vets that need assistance. So uh, without further ado, I'll stop um, talking to you guys about policy. I really appreciate uh, you all being here and, and for listening uh, personally. Uh, this opportunity means a lot to me, uh, my grandfather, and also my best friend, who next week uh, will have not been with us any longer for a year, uh, was a, a Korean War vet, and uh, our, our uh, soldiers just have hearts of, of gold. And it, it just really means a lot that uh, we can be here today to honor them. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Kevin, again, and thank you for your table with all the literature on it. Please stop by and see him. He brought a ton of uh, packets. And with that, I know um, the House and Senate was working on bills at 2 in the morning last night, so Timmy sent Bob here to speak for him. So, Bob, with that, can you come up? I didn't have your last name, so I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Anderson, and uh, Matt's right. We, my boss is in... Uh, real late night sessions last night till about two or three in the morning and they had it uh, reconvene again for 10 a.m. to get the rest of the bills passed for the year. Um, so uh, welcome and ha thank you again. My name is Bob Anderson. Um, I'm the state, um, our district director for state representative Timmy Beeson right from here from Bay City from Bangor Township. Uh, Rep Beeson sends his regards of course um, and Rep Beeson's district is a 96 district. It's wholly within Bay County. We only don't represent, weirdly enough, Auburn or uh, Pink County. Those are the only parts of Bay County that we don't represent. But we're your, your most local office, um, probably the first line for, for any of the veterans that reach out to us. Um, probably talk to me or one of my coworkers that we're gonna be hiring again soon. But we work very and well with collaboration with the, the higher offices than us and we appreciate everything that you guys do. I will be very brief. Uh, Timmy just wanted me to mention a few things. Um, as many of you guys know, he's a, a big small business advocate, uh, owns owns Beeson's Market, which is a fourth generation business here in Bay County. Uh, his dad, Big Tim, was in the Air Force and served during Vietnam. Um, during his first term, Rep Beeson, uh, actually our first bill that we got passed, which was a really cool experience, I got to see that firsthand, uh, was that we passed a highway renaming bill for Christopher J. Gould, who is a Bay County resident. His mom, Ann uh, Gould, reached out to us, great family. Um, it's on M13 near Sheboygan and Creek. Uh, he was a, in the U.S. Army, Army and died in Afghanistan in 2001, I, or 2011, I believe. Um, and we had been able to secure a highway renaming for him, and it's really cool. The sign's out there right past the bridge, um, and it's right in their backyard, too. That's the unique part, is that they live right off the river there, and they can see it every single morning when they, when they wake up, and it's, it was a very moving thing to be a part of. Um, uh, Red Beeson also supported and fought for the expansion of the property tax credit to the spouse of a veteran who became permanently disabled while serving. I don't think in Michigan law prior to this bill passing, it was extended to the spouse um, and, and he fought to support that. Uh, we were also able, able to, in last year's budget, not this year's budget, um, secure $300,000 in funds for the Bay Area Veterans Workshop. Uh, that's Keith Markstrom's group and their outfit that just right down the road here They do a really good job and really cool stuff over there and we were able to secure them some money for that um, Rep Beeson also supported this term um, February 1st of each year starting I think Next year uh, will be Blue Star Mother's Day in Michigan uh, Helping honor those who volunteer to visit hospital or hospitalized veterans prepare care packages and honor fallen heroes during funeral visits um, I saw the Blue Star Mother sign coming in on my way in here too and it made me think of that and I know that going forward in Michigan it'll start to be a, be a big thing. Um, Rep Beeson also supported legislation that would help remove some roadblocks for veterans entering the workforce after their military service ends. 
These bills would waive the occupational licensing fees for vets and their dependents for five years after military or uniformed service ends. Um, that's House Bill 6400, and it extends the courtesy to all veterans, not only active duty members, which I think Michigan law says now. Um, and lastly, real quick, um, we just really appreciate you guys' support uh, and help, and we're here to be a resource for you as well. And thanks to everybody that brought those, and please take some of those. We have a ton of them. They're no good sitting in our office, so please take as many as you can. Any groups, pass them out to your friends and family. They're very helpful. Tons of good info in there. Uh, and reach out to us anytime if you ever need anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob Anderson. At this time, we're going to do question and answer. And so if you have any questions, please uh, address them. And Beth and Mark, you're coming up for question and answer, correct? And all the thank you guys, all the guest speakers again for will be willing to answer. Go ahead, Matt, if I could have one more moment at the mic. I want to uh, see a lot of friends and a lot of American heroes in the uh, building today here at this event. One that I'm especially appreciative of, Ryan Gale, who runs our central di director of our Bay County Central Dispatch. Uh, a great uh, active member of the military and not quite a veteran yet. I mean, you're, you're active. So uh, he just returned from a year of service. We couldn't uh, say where he was serving prior to his return, but he he served in Syria for one year and just returned back to his duties here in Bay County in uh, a couple of weeks ago, right, right, Ryan? Just in October, so yes, and I want to say when I served in Congress in 2022, Pete Hoekstra and I led a CODEL to Afghanistan for two weeks. And over there, the, uh, we, we visited a lot of the different uh, military installations around Afghanistan, but Bagram Air Base, we spent for a couple of days and the, as I recall, the temperature was 108 degrees with um, also a six year drought. And the, I think it's hard for us to imagine the conditions sometimes, especially in the Middle East, that are active military and those who have served previously and now Afghanistan has ended, but Iraq and all of our involvements in the Middle East have have always been a real challenge, even for American military. But we owe a, a special debt in every war, whether it's Korean or Vietnam or World War II or all of our engagements, especially the Middle East. Very, very oppressive conditions that the, that the active military serve in over there. And Ryan, thank you for your service in Syria and, and returning to the great responsibilities and, and great job that you're doing back here at Central Dispatch and your spouse. And we're especially thankful to our speakers uh, today. They're a huge help to us when we get stuck, uh, either in the process or when there's a question that we can't answer. When we don't have, uh, we especially lean on our federal, uh, uh, through uh, Congressman Kildee's office, if there's issues where we feel or where the veterans feel they actually need someone to intercede for them, because the process is stuck. Uh, they're trying to get military records or whatever the, the case may be. Uh, we lean heavy on them because at, at some point we get stuck. And there's a point where we hit a brick wall too. You know, when we're trying to get benefits or something to someone. Uh, so we're especially appreciative and we're very thankful that they're here today. So we have some questions that we're gonna ask. So if you definitely have questions, please let us know or you know, speak up and we'll definitely. So. Uh, first question on our list, we're just wondering, uh, especially on the federal side, is there any progress on the PFAS, PFA, AFFF? Uh, I know there's legislation. I didn't know if there was anything new or anything that needed to be. I don't necessarily have anything new. I know that the, the um, Senator has been working. He's incredibly invested in making sure that we can remediate PFAS. So uh, most recently, uh, when they were doing the interview with the FAA director, he asked them to his, for his commitment to help removing that foam um, out of the different places. I know that there was some funding uh, that they were seeking in some of the appropriations bills as well. Um, he, he's helped secure significant dollars around for PFAS remediation. Still not done yet. Uh, it's something that we're still working on. So, but 
nothing nothing like majorly new and, and breaking, but definitely he is continuing to hit on over and over and over again and working with secure funding. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're especially as as we're from Michigan, we know there's obviously a small problem up at Wordsmith Air Force Base. I think every military installation in the world has had this stuff uh, somewhere, some in some chemical or some process that they've used for, uh, you know, cleaning automotive parts to aircraft to fighting fires to. So it's it's everywhere. But we know, especially here in Michigan, Wordsmith has a has a problem with uh, being in the wells and the water up there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Beth Yerk with the Director of the Bay County Department on Aging, and we work with everyone who sits up here on top of it, along with our Veterans Association um, in Bay County, like hand in hand, as we serve many of our veterans um, with the services we have. So we're hearing a lot about the expansion of Grayling Camp, and this is for everybody. Can you give us an update on where we are with that? Go ahead. Okay. You want me to sit here? You want me to You can come up, yeah. Go ahead if you want. Okay. Uh, so, uh, if I can recall correctly, I'm pretty sure this is like one of the first 10 issues um, that we heard about when we took office. So, um, essentially, for those of you who, who might not be aware, um, the National Guard put forward a lease proposal uh, to expand uh, the use of some state lands that are owned and managed by the DNR. Uh, my understanding is Camp Grayling is about 150,000, what is that? No, not square feet. Acre, um, acre. Acres, thank you. Um, and they were looking to, I think a little bit over double it. Uh, there's some kind of training uh, exercises that they wanted to uh, start doing at that um, facility. Uh, it's low impact training, so uh, I think the common speak for that means like no flames, no stuff blowing up, right? If I recall correctly, um, it was mainly like cyber security training type radio, or not radioactivity, but radio wave type stuff um, that they wanted to, to use the land for. And uh, there was significant pushback uh, from a lot of the local municipalities and uh, neighborhood associations um, up in the Grayling area and northern Michigan in general that came down uh, as far as, as our region, um, I believe Bay County and Midland County uh, passed a proclamation uh, saying that they were not in support of the expansion, if I recall correctly. Um, so, um, anyways, yeah, there's just there's a tremendous pushback from the locals and from some environmental groups with concerns that uh, the training was going to negatively impact uh, the area and um, you know the nature up there. And so, uh, the DNR sat on the lease proposal for a while, uh, and then they denied it. Uh, and then, following that. Uh, the two departments, so the DMVA and the DNR, uh, entered into a what's called an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, which is basically just sets the terms of uh, the DNR saying, okay, we are willing to let uh, the DMVA apply for special use, special land use permits uh, to uh, every year they can apply to use up to 52,000 acres, I think, of land. There were some issues with the initial lease proposal. Uh, I believe that uh, some of the buffer zones that they put around, you know, streams and so forth up there were uh, being infiltrated, I guess, by the lease proposal. So long story short, there's this MOU out there uh, that explains what the DNR will allow the National Guard to expand onto their property and do, uh, and now there's not been a special land use permit uh, put forward by the National Guard at this point. Uh, I do believe that they're working on one, um, and so, uh, you know, at this point they could uh, put that permit forward, and there's a whole process for, you know, getting public input and all of those sorts of things, um, but eventually we would hope that we can get to a point where the National Guard can 
get the land use that it needs and you know the DNR and all the local residents and environmental folks uh, can feel comfortable and that uh, the lands are being taken care of properly. So that's kind of where that's at right now. It's not really a legislative deal. Um, it's between the two state departments. So we really have nothing to do with it other than uh, constituents calling us to tell us how they feel about it. Uh, but that's it. If I can, if I can just add to uh, Kevin's remarks, uh, we were, we've always been very, very supportive of our National Guard training uh, campground in Grayling, Michigan. And uh, the main opposition, I think, came as a result of the massive expansion for training, but it wasn't going to be National Guard training. It was going to be defense contractors, primarily from California, that would lease that land to do testing of various weapon systems and and uh, uh, defense um, products. And there was uh, great concern about the expansion and also the fact that, uh, you know, former adjutant general of the Michigan National Guard opposed the expansion and also opposed basically of, um, you know, leasing basically out a lot of public land for their training use for the testing of new weapon systems and new new types of products used in war. So that I think altogether about 93 local governments kind of opposed it. And I think the, you know, the state, the two departments came together and they worked out a good resolution. Mm -hmm. So just thought I'd add that. Thank you for that. So we know in the area there's a shortage of housing and affordable housing, let alone housing for homeless veterans or veterans who may be uh, homeless soon. Is there anything relating to homeless veterans or any that you all know of that? Um, I, the only comment that I would, I would note with that is, um, I know the Senator just recently shared some news that doesn't necessarily impact the, the Bay County area, uh, but Marquette, there was some new state uh, veteran housing that was put in, I think it was over $50 million was invested in it. I defer to the state folks on that, but I know that the Senator did help get some of that funding that was there and then it's part of a state earmark. Um, there is a program that I've, I've talked with a number of different individuals um, throughout throughout our region uh, talking about the HUD VASH program. Um, and I know there's been some uh, requests or um, discussions around how do we expand that to be able to have it accessible to more individuals. Um, just because the way that the housing must be set up, it must, it, it, it's a little bit uh, restrictive. It's not community living. It's more like an individual apartment and whatnot. Um, so I know that there are some discussions about HUD match, as well as there is some success on the state side in getting some new veteran housing. Uh, nothing that I can speak to directly within this region, but know that it is something that we're, we're working on. Uh, Marquette is the recent, most recent success this year. Thanks, sir. You got anything? Do you have anything? Yeah, I, uh, I'll add a, a couple okay. things. Uh, so I did just kind of want to expand that um, veteran homelessness uh, and uh, lack of housing uh, for veterans is, is an issue that we're aware of. Um, in the most recent state budget, again, there was a new uh, $2 million allocation uh, for grants to combat uh, veteran homelessness. Uh, if I recall the numbers correctly, I think it is 13 grants at 100, up to $150,000 a grant that could be awarded to uh, the agencies that apply for them. And then uh, from there, they can be used to combat veteran homeless in a, a number of ways, I believe, whether that's you know capital construction or whether that's uh, you know helping to uh, keep a veteran where they currently are by helping them pay for you know arrears they may have. Um, so there's that piece of it. Another piece that uh, we are aware of is that um, across the state of Michigan, there is uh, a lack of housing in what we're calling the missing middle, meaning um, middle income uh, families, veterans included, uh, are having a difficult time finding housing that they can afford, right? They can't afford what's on the market, but they don't qualify for low income housing. Uh, so we did introduce legislation uh, that our office did that would uh, sort of loosen up some of the restrictions uh, on 
dollars in uh, MISHTA, which is the state's housing development authority, um, the state department. It would loosen some of the restrictions on some funds that they have uh, that they can use to uh, now, well, assuming the legislation makes it all the way through, they would be able to uh, take in, uh, funding that was specifically geared at um, specific housing developments and expand it so that it can be used uh, for more middle income housing projects. Um, I mean, that could fall in a, a number of different ways, whether that's uh, development, whether that's uh, you know possibly down payment assistance. Um, it just would open up the options of flexibility uh, so that folks in that that are stuck in that middle and looking for housing can uh, get some more assistance. So we do look forward to uh, progressing that legislation. That's, again, another thing that's going to be uh, something that probably doesn't see more movement until uh, the new year, but um, something that we're working on. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask Quentin to come up and give us a um, update on Camp Lejeune and the PACT Act update right now. And then Mark is going to kind of give us an update on local level too. So, Yeah, the, the team asked if I could give a quick update on the PACT Act. Um, Senator Peters was, uh, was very big on making sure that this, uh, that law got signed into action. Um, quick update on it, I would encourage if you're interested in seeing more of the hard numbers, um, the VA has done a really great job with creating a PACT Act dashboard. If you literally Google PACT Act dashboard, you get this awesome document that's updated all the time that has all of the facts, figures, and numbers, and so that's where I'm getting a lot of my information right now. Um, total number of PACT Act claims that have been approved. Um, the window is from August 10 of 22 until 10-21 of this year. Uh, 513, over 513,000 claims were approved. Um, had a 76.9 approval rate for PACT Act re related claims. Uh, average days for a PACT Act related claim completion is 154. Um, there's been, since September 6 of 22 to 10, 22 of 23, 4,760,619 total toxic exposure screenings have occurred, um, of which 42% were found to have at least one potential exposure, 8% um, or excuse me, roughly 9% had more than one exposure, um, and roughly 1.6 million had exactly, exactly one potential exposure. So there's a lot that's happening. Again, I could go on and on and on about data, but I would heavily or highly recommend going and searching uh, PACT Act dashboard, um, and it'll be, you'll be able to get this. They literally just updated this uh, on October 27th with the recent data. So um, really great work that's being done, that we're, and this is a, a great visualization to see um, how important this, this uh, act truly is. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. it, that's obviously a huge concern, especially uh, not only to the Gulf War era and later vets, uh, also to some of the uh, Vietnam veterans as well and other veterans in between with the opening of the Camp Lejeune, with the opening of Guam, um, Johnston Island and the other islands in the Pacific where things happened. It also opened uh, um, Laos and Cambodia. So there are obviously a huge number of issues tied up in that, not just for younger veterans, but for, or for other veterans as well. So I definitely encourage you, if you think you have a claim, definitely come see us or see your local service officer and get uh, the claims into VA. So one of the things when we did this, when the, we heard that the PACT Act was ending, it, it didn't end, it was just the one year presumptive date that you could get extra a uh, one year back. Um, I can't tell you how many people we saw in the office for August, it was absolutely wall to wall. Uh, every appointment was booked, we had people in the middle of appointments, we had people coming in, we had phone calls, we were trying to get back to people. It was for us in the five years that I've been in that office, a record number that we filed compensation claims, pension claims, survivor, spent, uh, survivor spouse claims, uh, reconsiderations for dependency indemnity because now all these places were open for uh, veterans for the spouse who's now living who can now apply for those benefits where before they were denied because we weren't there there was an agent orange there uh, and now 
so there is so especially on those encourage if you think you have a claim you have a question call us at the office we'll be definitely happy to even work through it go over everything with you on those um, it's a huge it was a huge thing and we're definitely grateful for uh, for the, uh, the the federal side of the house there to uh, definitely get that passed opened up a huge amount of things for the veterans everywhere uh, so when we were looking at claims originally there were about 600,000 in the claim queue at VA so once the date actually passed when for that retro that one year retro period there are now over a million claims so all told everybody service officers everyone in the United States filed over 400,000 claims basically within the last six months of this year huge huge I mean that's a, a huge number we were like I said packed from from opening until closing uh, five days a week trying to get claims in if you haven't filed a claim I encourage you to do so uh, doesn't mean you can't you can certainly do that we'll definitely get uh, if you need health care at VA at Saginaw we'll definitely uh, help you get into that as well they're there as well they have eligibility folks uh, at Saginaw who can help you file those you can come see us you can get the forms offline if you have any questions uh, just give us a call we'll be happy to help and get uh, get claims filed and get them in there were some intent to files that were filed for those that file claims uh, which extended that period so you still have time but don't wait until August of next year to come see us get your claim filed so just let me give an update oh um, um, so we know there's also a huge backlog obviously at VA so we're working through it trying to get uh, so updates are a little bit slower things are uh, are not uh, uh, progressing as fast necessarily because now the VA has got to find records find time for when people are in Guam or other places that we weren't ever there um, so for those and then we've had uh, some issues with newer veterans or the younger veterans um, and they're even though they have electronic records they can't find them so that's still there's still all these uh, delays in getting records and things so and then claims obviously it's you know they've piled on all these claims and all the poor folks at VA we're trying to process them so it's just we ask uh, a great deal of patience with everyone uh, and most people have been very patient trying to get uh, answers to claims you know claims will sit in the queue for a while where it doesn't look like anybody's looked at it um, we know they're working behind the scenes from what we can see so just if you want to file a claim have a question on a claim just give us a call at the office uh, we'll be able to walk you through it or go ahead and file if you if you think uh, as an example so we've had uh, and this is the second person someone contacted and reached out to us about Libya we were the Air Force had a base in Libya during Vietnam and this is only the second person I've ever heard who was at one so we're looking at various things for them they were exposed to fuels uh, he worked on the flight line so there was noise there's you know uh, other issues with uh, breathing in all the, the fumes obviously because the jets and the fuel uh, refuelers and everything was always going at that time so just if you have any any questions about any claims uh, give us a call or come see us over there at the county so uh, so we're gonna move to the next question so just want to discuss you had mentioned briefly about the passing of the disabled veterans exemption especially as it relates to surviving spouses so if one of you just want to give a brief oh yeah um, all I know about it is that um, hold on let me find my part right here Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have a specific bill number, but um, there was, I know it was passed. Um, it was the expansion of the, oh wait, no, that's the expansion of the property tax one. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, that's the one. That's okay, the one. yeah. So I knew that was only for, I believe it was for active, uh, or it was the expansion of the property tax credit to the spouse of a veteran who became permanently disabled while serving. I think it's, 50 to 100 percent disabled gets 2,000 before it was only 2,000 dollars before this and um, now it's more so I can get specifics about that and send it to you Mark for okay, sure great yeah, yeah. Uh, so there's another issue um, that we recently uh, and this is a perfect example of uh, bipartisan legislation that passed with flying colors. Uh, the, we were seeing an issue where, uh, you know, again, disabled veterans uh, qualified for a property tax exemption. And I believe that um, even if the veteran passed, 
the spouse was still eligible for the exemption so long as they remain unremarried and uh, didn't move. So there was an, uh, I can't remember the county, somewhere up north, uh, spouse of a veteran, her spouse passed, and uh, you know, this happens often, she moved into a different home. I mean, when a, a, a spouse of a veteran loses their spouse, sometimes they move to downsize to a smaller home, now that they're one person. Sometimes they move so that they can be closer to other family. Uh, there are very good reasons for a veteran spouse to move. The issue was that uh, this person in particular moved and then was denied uh, their tax exemption by uh, the local assessor for that area uh, because there was a, uh, I guess some, it was kind of a gray area in terms of when we talk about this exemption, is it following the, the veteran or does it follow the, uh, the, the property, right? So uh, the legislation that we recently passed and got signed into a law, passed with immediate effect, uh, allows a, uh, the spouse of a veteran that has passed away uh, to still qualify for the exemption even if they move to a different homestead uh, as long as they remain unremarried. I don't know if that kind of clarifies a little bit, um, but it was a, it's a very real issue. Um, we had a number of constituents that reached out to our office about it at the beginning of the year, and now um, that issue is, uh, is being addressed. So uh, this is a really important one. So just to add to, so the, we know of a handful of cases here, particularly in Bay County, because we've had people reach out to us. Uh, obviously, there's nothing I can do to override the state or, uh, or township officials. Um, so they have to wait until January of 2025 before they can re-ask for that because there's not a process yet with the state to overturn those or with the boards of review. So they just have to wait a little bit. So don't move or you'll probably end up paying your property tax if you're already paying it. So just as a quick on that, so. So are there any new issues or legislation coming both sides, state and federal, relating to our women veterans and other underserved veteran populations? Nothing. Go, Kevin. So the question was, are there any new issues we're seeing? Legislation, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to speak from, from my perspective as somebody who does constituent services. Um, there are still a lot of issues uh, that we see today with veterans falling through the cracks for a number of different things. Um, so I'll give you a couple examples. Um, we had a constituent that was a veteran uh, and they had been homebound, stuck in their home since before the pandemic. So we're talking 2019, had some mobility issues uh, and couldn't exit their home because they didn't have the accessible arrangements, a ramp to get out. Uh, they were very low income uh, and so uh, they couldn't pay for a ramp and believe it or not, uh, it was actually fairly difficult uh, to get them a ramp. Uh, they contacted us in February and uh, we had to do a lot of hunting, going through different programs. Uh, you know, there are programs out there that help with these sorts of things, but oftentimes as it is with programs, you run into issues and roadblocks. So for example, there was one program we were looking at and uh, it required that the individual come in person to do paperwork and uh, I'm not gonna name the organization, but, and I understand, you know, all of our organizations that do these kinds of works are stretched thin, and so they don't always have the ability to go right to the person, but in this case, you know, they wanted them to come in person and there was, there was no exceptions. And so uh, that program didn't fit. Uh, so after months, uh, we were able to find a program that was able to 
uh, support this veteran uh, and get them a ramp. And because of the, the need, because this veteran had not seen their doctor in person in four years, uh, they did speed up their process and get this ramp built uh, in the spring. But, uh, you know, that's just an example of, you know, there are needs that veterans have that sometimes it, it's not just to make a phone call and it happens, right? Um, another thing that we see quite often is, uh, we just talked about this, it's uh, spouses and families of veterans. Uh, you know, a lot of our veteran services, uh, you know, they're attached to the veteran and, you know, they will help the families, but they are, are limited in terms of how far they can go for the families or the spouse as opposed to the veteran themselves. Um, so, you know, we've had constituents that are uh, homeless veteran families that, you know, are amazing partners at the State Department, you know, paying for hotel rooms out of their own personal pockets just to keep a veteran off the streets. Um, you know, so we see issues uh, with veteran homelessness and, uh, you know, right now we've got great programs like HUDVASH, um, but we have constituents that have uh, those vouchers through that program and there's no housing available uh, that they can use those vouchers for. So they're in limbo they feel, and it's so frustrating because they've gone through the process, they've done the work, our agencies have done the work to give them the assistance that they need and they're ready to go. But when they get to the market, everything is priced out of reach or it's full. So then what, where do they go? Well, they can go to our shelters, but guess what? Our shelters are also full. So I would say, at least from uh, what I see on my end of this office, is veteran homelessness is one of the biggest issues um, that we're seeing right now, and it's, it's getting worse. Yeah. Restate the questions. I think I have exactly. So are there any new issues or legislation relating to women veterans and underserved veteran populations? So I wouldn't necessarily know that there's new issues. Uh, there has been some work on, on that front. I know that um, we've seen at least two armories that have been updated or the uh, armory modernization efforts that they're doing. Um, one of them is, is uh, nearby in a neighboring Saginaw, um, updating the facilities so that there are spaces that are suitable for both for women, but also suitable for men. Uh, many of those places were not updated. I had the opportunity to walk through it. It's absolutely beautiful with what they've done with the space to be able to allow um, these individuals that are serving our country a space to be able to change, take a shower, relax for a minute before they're moving on to that next piece. Um, in regards to the PACT Act, interestingly enough, um, demographic analysis of new enrollees from the PACT Act planning population has identified a potentially meaningful difference across gender. Women veterans have a higher representation among the new enrollees from the PACT Act planning population than the baseline of non-enrolled PACT Act population. So we're knowing that this is a positive uh, that is indicating that um, Women veterans are aware of their eligibility and choosing to enroll. Um, there are also some notes in the in the Q4 report talking about how um, um, individuals of different diaspora groups, um, African American, um, Latino, that they are also seeing a higher uh, number as well. So, in the aspect, there's a, a an, an advertising campaign that they've been doing to push out the the PACT Act and uh, the accessibility to those those benefits. So we're seeing that women, as well as minorities, are taking advantage of it, which was uh, my concern, making sure that they are getting taking advantage of that, that care. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So then the last question that we have, uh, so we all hear about congressional inquiries. Make an question, you know, contact your congressman about the VA about, um, so we're just wondering if you can speak to um, are there benefits and are there limitations on such inquiries? So when it comes to constituent service work, it, absolutely reach out to our office. If you think that, you know, you're, if you're finding that a claim is taking excessively long or um, you're not getting the care or potentially you got uh, um, 
uh, a result that it was not, not, you know, this is not something that we're going to be able to take care of, reach out to us. Um, I know that the one note that I, I spoke to a member of uh, Congressman Kildee's team, um, and they had noted that they had a, a couple of people fall ill in their, in their office, and I had said, well, do you want me to say anything? And they had said, you know, just make a note that reach out to us if you have a constituent matter with a federal agency and you're looking for some assistance. That is what we are there for. Um, speaking specifically for the Senator's team, um, he has a dedicated team of, of individuals that sit in our Detroit office um, that pr provide that constituent service care. Are there limitations? Uh, yes, but we, if I was to go through a laundry list of limitations, it's a much easier phrase to give us a call, shoot us an email, um, or quite frankly, just go right onto the Senator's website that you can go um, under services and there's get help with a federal agency. You could fill out the privacy of release form, which allows us to go and advocate uh, uh, for you on your behalf with the different federal agencies. You could beat a step. You don't even need to make a phone call. You could fill out the form and a member of the constituent services team will reach out. Otherwise, if you reach out to the Bay Region office that's located in Flint, either Lacey or I would be more than happy to help get you directed. So um, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a limitation or, or like what are those limitations? There are. There's things that we can do, but I'd much rather have you reach out to us uh, and I say, honestly, there's nothing we can do um, because generally that, that the, the back half of that sentence is we can't do anything necessarily on this item, but we'd recommend that you reach out to Senator McDonald Rivet's office or um, your state rep or, or, um, or state senator. So there are some things that I've seen in benefits where people reached out. We're not necessarily able to help them, but we're able to get them in the contact with the right people to help move their issue forward. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if there are any questions or anybody has anything, otherwise, unless you have closing remarks or anything you'd like to say or we're good? Okay. Good. Yeah. So I guess we'll close the question and answer period. Uh, we're here till two o'clock, obviously. So yes, sir, go ahead. Sorry. The federal side. Are you aware of? Because I don't know if this is just conjecture or speculation. Are you aware of maybe the regional approach in VA allocations or, or compensation approvals? I should term it that way. Um, there's there's some some under undercurrents about people that believe that if they live in a certain region within the United States, they're more likely or less likely to have their claims approved or processed in a timely manner. Is there any, any truth to that? That is the first that I have heard of, of that, but it's definitely a concern that we'd be more than happy and willing to raise with the team. Um, if you want to go shoot me an email, Lacey, have you heard anything, have you got anything like that in the realm of emails or phone calls or mail that we've seen? So I, that's the first that I've heard of it, but it doesn't mean that it's not something that we couldn't address or at least get an answer to. Um, so I'll make sure you got my card. I'm happy to have you shoot me an email on it and I can get it in front of the legislative team and ask them, hey, what's going on with this? Or constituent services for that matter. Specifically, so. um, thank you. Specifically mm -hmm. for context, when you're referring to uh, PFAS, PACPAC, these, these things that are given these um, really well thought out graphics online. That's one thing that does seem to be lacking is a representational background of the state-by-state -state category and if there was any truth to it, we would be able to see it there. So I was just wondering how we extrapolate that information from that. Yeah, I know that um, there's there's two documents that they generally put on that on that dashboard site. They've got the one pager and then they generally have an Excel document that I believe has raw data. I obviously have not gotten into it um, specifically because I know that there'll be a rabbit hole and a whole two days will be gone. I'm like, wait, what happened? Uh, love data, love getting data. So I don't know the answer to your question, but it's definitely something that we would love to raise and I know that the, the Senator would want to hear about it. And I know yeah. that the PACDAP dashboard does have it broken up by the state. Um, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, they have a couple different reports. Like, there's one that's a Q4 report that's a lot longer. The one that I was referencing was a you know, a quick snapshot uh, in at the end of October. So that only had seven pages in it. But I didn't get that deep in there. But maybe it's in there. I'll take a peek while we're while we're wrapping up, and uh, otherwise we're going to take a look at it after. Any other questions for our esteemed panel? Uh, we definitely appreciate them coming out today. Uh, they provide, as I said, a huge support to not only our office, uh, but to all of Bay County and, and the staff at the Bay County building and the folks that work there that uh, try to get benefits out to everybody. Um, we're especially grateful to Matt and to uh, Jim Barsha, who support us in a huge way in Veterans Affairs, 
uh, down on the first floor of the county building. If uh, you've been around for a while, you know we used to be up in the back corner, up on two, way in the back. It was a great space. Uh, the space we have is obviously much nicer. It's more private. Uh, conversations aren't open to nearly everybody on the floor. Um, so we're definitely we're definitely grateful to the county. Uh, we're grateful to the state uh, through the uh, uh, the the, uh, the veteran veteran service grant that we get, which helps with some of our programs. Uh, it it uh, takes care of our uh, funding for staff, and we then move what the money we would use we use that for emergency relief. So we definitely uh, we definitely uh, appreciate that a great deal. Um, that's helped us out. It helped us remodel that whole space to make it. Uh, uh, easier for us to do what we do. So uh, we're here till two o'clock. If you have any questions, feel free to visit our vendors. Uh, we are greatly uh, thankful that they were able to come out today, and, and do appreciate everything that they. We have a wide variety of folks from uh, many different levels of government. So uh, if there are any questions or anything, please feel free, and our table will be here. We'll be here as well. So we we thank everyone who came out, uh, and we thank uh, especially our, our steam panel here. So thank you.